if you have your Bibles, turn, to me, turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Today I want to speak to you on the subject of a Christian father. Christian father. And uh, if you have a bulletin and you want to follow along with us, uh, please just follow along in that bulletin. Let me go ahead and give you the outline, and then we'll get right into the message. Number one, a Christian father is a forgiving father. Is a forgiving father. Number two, a Christian father is a loving father. A loving father. Number three, a Christian father is a teaching father. A teaching father. Number four, a Christian father is a consistent father. A consistent father. So let's look at a Christian father today. I want to show you four characteristics of a Christian father. Number one, a Christian father is a forgiving father. Colossians 3, verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, men, we are chosen by God. Fathers, God chose us. God saved us. God came to us. Holy. We need to be holy as Christian fathers. That's Christ-like. God is holy, 2 Peter says. And beloved, God loves us. And we'll be talking about that in just a second. Then he says, put on. As we get dressed in the mornings, we put clothes on. And we need to clothe ourselves. And you will notice many of these are also the nine fruits of the Spirit. It's not the exact thing, but it's very, very close to that. So if we are going to be Christ-like, we have to have these fruits of the Spirit in our life. Tender mercies, okay? Our kids are going to mess up. We are going to mess up. We are going to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And we need to show others mercy because God has shown us mercy. Kindness. Folks, a kindness goes a long ways. We really do. And by the way, this doesn't just apply to fathers. This applies to any Christian. Any Christian. So I want to speak specifically to the fathers, but kindness, kind words, kind deeds, okay? These are things that we as leaders of our home need to be. Humility. And this is a lost word in our world today. Uh, you know, it, people want to be number one. People want to be on top. And folks, I am telling you, if you want to be like Jesus, men, if you want to be like Jesus, you need to be humble. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 says, Jesus humbled himself and came to earth. We need to be meek. Meek is not weak, okay? Meek is not weak. It is, uh, you know, meekness under self-control. Okay, we, we need to watch what we say. We need to watch our tempers. And I've heard people say, well, my dad had a temper, so I'm going to have a temper. Well, you don't have to, folks. You can break that chain, and meekness is a characteristic we need to have, and Jesus had in his life. Long-suffering is patience. Patience. In the last four months, I have been practicing this really hard. And for some reason, I need more work, all right? I don't understand all the time what God is doing, but I know God is in control, and I know God's going to take care of it in his time. Amen. And we are an impatient generation. We want it now, all right? We can have hot coffee in two minutes. We can have popcorn bowl in three minutes. We're going to have all these instant oatmeal in about a minute and a half. But I'm telling you, a characteristic a Christian father should have is patience. Bearing one another. Bearing one another. That's giving others the benefit of the doubt. The benefit of the doubt. It goes a lot along with mercy and, for, and with one another. And forgiving one another. Oh, fathers, we need to learn to put the past behind. You realize you can't change anything you did yesterday? 
Yesterday is history, okay? And we need to be forgiving. And not only forgiving, I want to add the word forgetting. Because there's some people I've talked to many times that says, I'll forgive them, but I sure won't forget it. And I want to make this statement. If you're not forgetting it, you probably haven't forgiven them. Let it go. Let it go. I still go back to uh, what Jesus, I, the greatest example I've ever seen of forgiveness is found in Luke uh, 23, basically verse 34. Luke 23, 34. He was on the cross. He had done nothing wrong. Nothing. He loved us so much that he died for us. And he looked at the group of people that crucified him and said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Folks, that is true forgiveness. It is wiping the slate clean. It is not bringing it up again. And folks, I am telling you of one thing. There's two things that Satan wants to do to you. Number one, he wants to make you fear. He wants fear in your life. And the other thing is, he likes to remind you of what you have done. And folks, we must, if we're going to be like Jesus and our Heavenly Father, we must forgive and we must forget and move on. Look at the rest of that verse. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. What does must do mean? Folks, that's not an option here, men. When someone asks for our forgiveness, matter of fact, the disciples questioned Jesus on this. And Jesus himself answered this. They said, hey, Jesus, if someone does me wrong, how many times do I have to forgive them? And I know in my human heart it's thinking, eh, maybe three times. Maybe three. And the answer, I believe, shocked the disciples. Seventy times seven. Four hundred and ninety times. And I've met a man or two that are keeping count of every time it happens. And they're looking for that 490th time. Folks, that's not forgiveness. If somebody truly asks for forgiveness, we need to forgive. Folks, I believe that a lack of forgiveness steals our joy. It steals our joy. So, we need to be forgiving fathers. Look at verse 14. Verse 14, not only do we need to be forgiving fathers, we need to be loving fathers. Look at verse 14 and 15. But above all these things, and folks, that's, that's, that, that sentence, that beginning of the sentence means a lot. I mean, when you think of forgiveness, it's huge. It is huge. But he's saying, even this is most important. But above all these things, put on love. We live in a day today that it's my, mine, mine, self-gratification. What's in it for me? You help me and I'll help you. And folks, that's not love. We have gotten so far away from what true love is. Greater love than no man hath than this, than to lay down his life for another. Folks, Jesus, well first, God showed his love by sending his son to die for you and I. And then Jesus showed his love for us. He could have come down off that cross, but he didn't. But of all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection, perfection. And folks, there's such a, a, a shortness, there's such a, a weakness of love in our nation and in our society. And there's so much hate. I just can't believe, I, I read the stat just the other day that already there's been over 300 mass shootings. We're only in July, folks. 300 mass shootings in the world, you know, uh, already. Why? Because people don't love one another. And folks, love, the Bible says, covers 
a multitude of sin. And anywhere you see, you know, like the fruits of the, fear, the Spirit, what does it begin with? Love. Love. Calvary's love. And we, we look at the bond of perfection, and that is being like Jesus. He was perfect. His love is perfect. His love was genuine. His love was deep. And men, I know sometimes there, a lot of men are not emotional. It doesn't matter whether you're emotional or not emotional. Just knowing that, you know, the people know that we care. I saw my father cry two times in my life. It was at the death of his father and the death of his mother, and I had never seen that. And so I, I had to learn. And now I'm telling you, uh, you know, the older I get, the more the tears flow. I cry all the time. I'm just like, what's wrong with you? And I think it's because I'm 65 years old, <laughs> all right? I think our heart, I'm serious about this, our heart becomes more tender the older we get. All the things that I've seen, 43 years of ministry, folks, I've seen a lot of things. And a lot of things have just brought tears to my eyes. And your kids and your wife need to know. I mean, I knew my father loved me, but he never expressed it. The first time he told me was the day I surrendered my life to the youth ministry. So that day, he told me that he loved me. And it was just like a burden was lifted off of me. And again, folks, I'm not putting my father down. I know what his father was like. I knew growing up about that and all that went on. Again, we men, we have to break the chain. We don't have to be like those who were in front of us. Love everyone unconditionally. Unconditionally. Look at verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You want peace in your life. You make peace with everything, everyone. I say this every night before I go to bed. I ask myself three questions, and my church family knows what I'm fixing to say. Number one, am I right with God? Am I right with God? And if I'm not, I stop, and I confess, and I ask God. I did it last night. I do it every night. Number two, am I right with my family? Am I right with my family? Not trying to justify anything or if she started it, or man, that kid's getting on my nerves. You know, and not, no, that's not confession, folks. All right, confession is God, I'm sorry. God, I was wrong. I was wrong. Man, you are not Fonzie. Remember the show, Happy Days? And one, one time, Fonzie was trying, he was wrong, and he was trying to say, I was wrong. I was wrong. I was, he, he couldn't even get it out of his mouth. And then he just shouted, I was wrong. Amen. You will be wrong. Okay? Ask your wife. She'll tell you. You're wrong. <laughs> no, folks. Our Heavenly Father tells us when we're wrong. And we need to admit it, and we need to quit it. Am I right with God? Am I right with my family? Am I right with my fellow man? That's what I love about church. I love the unity in the body of Christ. I love the love of God in the body of Christ. I love the Christian community in the body of Christ. When one of us hurts, everyone hurts with, with them. When one of us cries, you cry with us. When we're happy, you are happy with us. Folks, love is so important. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called into one body, one is unity, and be thankful. Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. And everybody knows the story of the prodigal son and how he was young and he was dumb and he was making bad decisions. And he went to his dad and said, man, I want my inheritance now. All right? I know what my dad would have said. He says... You know, bend over and I'll give you your inheritance, all right? Or, or come here a little closer and I'll give you your inheritance. That would have never happened at my house, all right? He says, pack your bags and go. You ain't getting no money, all right? But this father loved 
this son. And this father just simply did what the son asked him to do. And you know the story, folks. He wasted it, went away, and he was sitting in a hog pen. And he was so hungry, so hungry, the slop looked good. Folks, you've got to be pretty hungry to have that cross your mind. And he looked up and he thought, man, I really blew it. I'm going to go back to my father's house. And I'm going to go ask him if I can have my place back. Not at the table as a servant. That's what I call a come to Jesus moment. A come to Jesus moment. And pick it up in verse 20. And when he arose, he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. That is love. Love is compassion. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. All right? I mean, that's, again, that's, that's not how most of us would have done. But he was showing the father's love. You know, I thought about this many times, and I'd say, I would have probably said, son, when you get a haircut and you get a bath, and you ask me real nicely, you can come back into my home. Folks, that's not love. All right? When someone is hurting, we show compassion on them. Verse 21, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring and put uh, on his hand and sandals and put on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead. He was dead. He thought he was dead. He'd been gone so long, and he's alive again. He was lost. And they began to make merry. Folks, is that not a picture of what Jesus Christ done for us? We were dead in our trespasses and sin. We had no way. We couldn't work enough. We couldn't go to church enough. We couldn't give enough to get into heaven. But God looked down upon us and forgave us of our sins, wiped the slate clean and says, Son, I love you. Men, we need to show our wives and our children and our grandchildren the love of Jesus. So a Christian father is a forgiving father. He is a loving father, and he is a teaching father. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Last week we had the Gideons here, and we talked about the importance of the word of God. And with that still on our minds, folks, I am telling you, we as men need to lead out in our homes I mentioned this last week, but I'm going to mention it again this week. It is the Father's responsibility to lead a devotion. I know it is old-fashioned. I understand that. I understand everybody has the, phone, the, the Bible on their phones. But there's just something about a family that prays together and reads the Word of God together stays together. Let the Word of God well, in you richly with all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Men, the Word of God needs to be a priority in our lives. Do you realize that you teach every day? It just reminds me of like when it snows and maybe... Your grandkid is with you, and you're going to the shed, or you're going outside, and you have footsteps in front of you, and your grandkids or your kids are trying to follow you in those footsteps. Folks, we need to lead and guide them with the Word of God. We have learned how important the Word of God, and we are teaching not just by what we say, but what we do. It is so important that we are teaching fathers. And, and again, we need to teach them about life. One of the things that I regretted as I grew up, my father did his best to teach me how to work on vehicles and cars. And I, he, he'd make me do that, and all the kids in the neighborhood would be waiting for me. 
I had the basketball and I had the football and I had the baseball at my house. And so I just, I didn't learn anything. And I found out young in marriage, I could have fixed a lot of things and saved me, me and Lori a lot of money if I would have listened to my father. They're, listen, young men, young ladies, they're not as dumb as you think they are. All right? They're smart. They've lived life. Learn from them. Follow them. Listen to them. Admonishing one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. I cannot tell you how important it is that we listen to Christian music. Christian music. I love the hymns. I love that every one of our hymns, they're based on the Word of God. There is a Scripture text for every one of our hymns. But folks, the choruses are good. The choruses are so good. The good, good Father. I, I was preaching over in a... in in an Alma, and it, it was a youth revival years ago. And I'm telling you, God broke out in that place. And I think that night, 18 youth got saved. And they were singing that song, The Good, Good Father. And afterwards, we got so caught up in there, and, and the pastor's name was Aaron, and he said, Brother Mike, do you know how many times we sang The Good, Good Father? And I said, I have no idea. He said, 12 times. Because young people just started coming and giving their heart to the Lord. Folks, we need Christian music in our lives. We need the Word of God through music permeating our whole being. Even Saul, when he messed up, David would play the harp for him because he rebelled against God. Folks, Christian music. Music is very, very important. Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4. Look at Proverbs 4, verse 20. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find it. Oh, some, sometimes, folks when you're just feeling down, sometimes when you feel even depressed when Satan just, he won't let you up. Man, turn on some good Christian music. Open your Bible and read the psalm. It ministers to us. Fathers, we need to do this in our lives. For it says, for they are life to those who find them and health to their flesh. The Word of God will help you. Singing the Word of God in Christian music will help you. It will minister to your soul. And look what it says. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. I like the way the King James says, guard your heart with all diligence. Folks, I am telling you, what happens is a thought comes to our head and we can either listen to that thought or say no to that thought. And eventually, it goes to our heart, and we will act out what we thought of and what we allowed in our hearts. And folks, that's the key. We have to stop it right there in our minds. We cannot dwell on negative things. We cannot listen to Satan and his temptations. We must guard our hearts. Jesus comes into our hearts. Our hearts are everything. You cannot live without a heart. And folks, we need to guard our hearts. And in Proverbs, we need to teach our children and grandchildren the Word of God. The last thing I want you to see, not only is a Christian father a forgiving father, a loving father, and a teaching father, Christian father is a consistent father. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What does whatever mean? That means everything you do. You ask yourself, what would Jesus do? 
What would Jesus do? People are watching you. Your families are watching you. Your neighbors are watching you. Your friends are watching you. People at church are watching you. People at work are watching you. People at ball games are watching you. We need to be consistent as fathers. And that's why this, this little clip I showed you about the OU girls, because our society is so obsessed with winning. It's truly this. Society tells us to win at all costs. At all costs. And folks, I am telling you, you will learn more in failures than you will at successes. People that have admitted things, they have failed and they have failed and they have failed. And then one thing clicks for them. And it is an amazing invention. And so we as fathers must be consistent with not only our words, but our actions. Our actions. People are watching us all the time. Matthew chapter 5, and I close with this. Matthew 5, you know this verse, but I want to share it with you again. Matthew 5, verse 14. Christians, you are the light of the world. Fathers, you are the light of the world. You're the go-to person. Your wife looks up to you. Your children look up to you. Your grandchildren. Don't you love grandchildren? I got to tell you this. Friday's my day off, and Kylie and I, we have a, a thing going. She's three years old. And every Friday, I go get her donuts. She calls on Thursday. Papa, you getting donuts? Yeah, Kylie, I'm going to get donuts. So we eat donuts, and we're sitting there playing in the living room. I'm in my chair. She got a brand new doctor set. Brand new. So she's wrapping my leg with the thing. She's checking my heart out. She's doing all these things. Now I'm telling you, the one Lori got her this year, it's, it was about the size of this here. I mean, the one before was just a little old lunchbox thing. So she was working at it. So she got through, and so I said the natural thing. I said, well, Kylie, what's wrong with me? And she looked at me and said, you eat too much. <laughs> <laughs> Three years old. I got under conviction. <laughs> I'm serious. They're watching us, folks. They watch everything we do. I nearly fell out of my chair. <laughs> I love them. And the best part, just like yesterday, we celebrated my, yes, my birthday yesterday, about 6 o'clock, I saw those taillights go out. Man, they've had cake, they had candy, they had ice cream, and you send them home. <laughs> Praise God. You are the light of the world. <laughs> A city that's set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor the, do they light a lamp and put it under a basket and put on a lamp. Stand. And it gives light to the whole house. What are you, Brother Mike? I'm a Christian. What are you, Brother Mike? I'm a father. What are you, Brother Mike? I'm a grandfather. What are you, Brother Mike? I'm a preacher. I don't want to fail my Heavenly Father. And I don't want to fail my children and my grandchildren. We men have a responsibility to be that light. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Fathers, I know we're not perfect. I know that. But man, we need to strive for perfection. We need to strive to be like Jesus. We need to have these 
four characteristics in our lives. And the Bible says in Proverbs, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, I'm telling you, they will come back. It may not be when you think it is. It may not be quick enough for you. But they will remember your life and who you are and what you stand for. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I just thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. I thank you that you have set the supreme example. God the Father who loved us. God the Son who died for us. And God the Holy Spirit who is in our lives. And Lord, we have all three of these things working for us. So God, I pray as we as men, as fathers and grandfathers, as we go about this thing called life, that people would see the joy of Jesus in our hearts and in our lives. God, I pray if there's one person here that doesn't know you, their greatest day would be the day they give their heart and their life to Jesus. And God, I pray that you just be with this, just watch over this invitation. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work and God, whether somebody needs to rededicate their life to Christ or come to Jesus or join this church or come for baptism, God, I pray that they would just step out. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being our Heavenly Father. Thank you for being the perfect example of what a father is. And God, we love you, and we thank you for your word. God, I pray your Holy Spirit would work. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?